Welcome, everybody, to the latest episode of the True Believers podcast here on the Fandom Podcast Network. Of course, True Believers is a show that covers everything that's happening in the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and it's big happenings right now. Maybe one of the most anticipated Marvel movies since maybe Endgame is out and with us, and that is, of course, Wakanda Forever. Um, this is a movie that is uh, incredibly powerful, incredibly emotional for obvious reasons, and a lot is happening as it is also the movie that wraps up phase four of the MCU, but I cannot take a trip to Wakanda without the appropriate, um, I guess, I don't know, Wakandans, um, some of them might be ambassadors, I, I'm not quite sure, as long as they haven't tried to steal any vibranium, I think we're okay, but first and foremost, I am joined, of course, by my partner, my brother from another mother, and of course, he is the co-founder of the Fandom Podcast Network, Mr. Kevin Reitzel. I have been a guest of Wakanda, but I'm definitely not Wakandan, but I've been there a few times uh, and I have left empty handed. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's probably a wise decision as far as that goes. But you know what? We got to continue on because it, it takes more than just me and Kevin to talk anything Black Panther. It's true. We got a it's crew. A big place, a lot going on. Um, she has seen the movie three times already, ladies and gentlemen. So we are officially making her our official Wakanda expert for this podcast. She's the one and only queen of movie foo, Miss Lacey Adderhold. Hello, hello. Do you have it memorized? Do you have it memorized? <laughs> I do not have it memorized. I do not. I promise. I'm, I was just going for enjoyment, not for, yeah. Because I was supposed to see it, right, Kyle? Because, you know, I figure <laughs> she was seeing it three times. She was seeing it for everybody maybe. on the panel. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> But of course, we do have one more on the panel. He is the Norse god of the Fandom Podcast Network. He is the co-host of Blood of Kings. Um, he's an incredibly talented inter individual, and I'm glad he's here for this particular podcast. The one and only Lee Fillingsness. It is good to be here, uh, Lacey and gentlemen. Uh, see what <laughs> yeah. I did there. <laughs> nice. Nice. Now, now, real quickly, you had a condition for, with me for coming on this podcast. because You had something you wanted to bring up about the original Black Panther. Yes. Um, as, as great as the original Black Panther was, it is pretty much a shot for shot remake of Iron Man 2. Um, a lot of people say, oh, there's only so many plots in film. Um, however, uh, they both begin with uh, the ceremony uh, that their father uh, played in before. Uh, they show up, uh, they fly in, have their powers slash suit stripped. They're surrounded by a whole bunch of dancing girls and they go through this ceremony. Uh, the bad guy is the son of one of his father's enemies uh, who has uh, dreadlocks and tattoos or body modifications, uh, who then teams up with a uh, kind of a goofy arms dealer uh, who kind of supports him. Then there's the double cross, uh, ends up taking over all of the military hardware, tries to use it against our um, hero with the fantastic suit, uh, as well as the innate power, whether it's the arc reactor or the heart shaped herb. <coughs> Um, you have the redheaded killing machine. You have the uh, woman who works for him that had, there's kind of an unrequited uh, love relationship with. You have the uh, post-mortem visit from his father. Uh, there are so many plot points that they just recreated, which Marvel's been doing since forever anyways. I mean, Gar Guardians of the Galaxy 2 is Star Trek 5. The Avengers is League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Uh, I mean, they, they, they do this, but they take them and they do them well. Even like Black Widow is pretty much a re remake of X-Men Origins Wolverine. But uh, what I will say is I liked Iron Man 2. Everyone kind of cramps on it the same way, you know, Kevin loves Iron Man 3. But I think it was a really good entry into the uh, series. And I think that they showed that they did it well. And... Uh, that's just kind of been my thing. Like you can still enjoy the movie and still recognize that they took almost every character in plot point down to like, you know, dreadlocks, body modifications and goofy white arms dealer. I think it's safe to say that Marvel uh, uses a lot of tropes in all their films. So, you know, it's uh, well, yeah. there, there's tropes <laughs> and then there's the complete plot of other movies and, and like minor plot details. So. How, however, Iron Man 2 does have Kevin's most requested returning villain, which he will finally be back in Armor Wars, Kevin. That's right. Mr. Hammer, baby. Let's bring him oh, back. Stop. Yes. Hammer time. Yeah. <laughs> Kyle. Well, you, you, you can direct any of your thoughts to Lee Fillings this on Facebook. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> no, um, we got a big show here. Let's, let's not delay yes kevin uh spoiler alert kyle <laughs> I'm, I'm gonna get there i'm gonna get let's there do this right gonna... at the top before we say anything else <laughs> well, we are gonna dive deep into black panther back black panther wakanda forever so <laughs> 
However, we do have one thing. We're going to do a little bit of quick crossing the streams of our dimensions here in our comic book things because we lost a icon in the comic book industry yesterday to cancer. Um, for many, he, he many consider him the one true Batman, and that was Kevin Conroy, who was the basically is the voice of Batman. It was started with voicing Batman with the original Fox run of Batman the animated series. Has done several film films voicing Batman and a lot of the DC animated projects. Um, guys. This one hurt. I'm gonna. I'm not even gonna lie to you. I've met Con Kevin Conroy a couple of times. He was one of the nicest people. In fact, I got lucky enough. The last convention I was at with him, I watched him literally stand up on the on a table and do the "I am the Knight" speech in front of everybody, which was great. But guys, a lot of people identify Kevin Conroy as the Batman, even be above a Michael Keaton and some of the other live act actors in live action that have played him. I want to kind of just give each of you a moment to just give a quick thought about um, Kevin Conroy. Um, Lee, I want to start with you on this. Um, I'd say he is the Batman the same way that Adrian Paul is uh, the Highlander. Uh, he had more time to develop the character. Um, he has a, a richer storyline than any other Batman that's ever been able to play it. Um, all the other Batman had bigger budgets. Uh, this guy had to do it on the power of his voice alone. And to the kids that grew up uh, watching uh, both that series, Batman Beyond, all that kind of stuff, uh, playing Arkham. Uh, I mean, this is the voice that we hear. You know, we don't hear Christian Bale with his Invisalign just kind of grumbling through everything. You know, we don't hear, you know, the whispering. We don't hear, uh, you know, George Clooney or Val Kilmer being snarky. We hear Kevin Conroy. And uh, he's, you know, when he goes to conventions, he understands uh, the same way that, uh, was it, it's not Peter Weller. What's uh, um, uh, Optimus Prime's? Peter uh, Cullen. Boy, Peter Cullen, Yeah. Uh, he understands uh, who he is to so many people uh, to the point where like he even played kind of a joke version of Batman uh, in the Venture Brothers, uh, which was a brilliant performance. Uh, so, yeah, this was this was one that hit hard just because how many, you know, afternoons after school that I just kind of sit there and eat peanut butter sandwiches and watch the show. So Lacey, the Batman of a generation, people will say. Agreed. Um, he and he was the nicest guy. Like, never a never a harsh word. I mean, just absolutely the sweetest guy. And I love the fact that they brought him in into the live action world in the DC crossovers um, mm -hmm. for the DC uh, you know television um, uh, universe. Um, and also, let's not forget, you know, he was a, an openly gay icon for many, many, many new people, bringing them into, um, you know, making things easier for actors and, and you know, people who are voiceover actors and stuff like that. So, yeah, just a really nice guy. Kevin, I, I know you and I both kind of had big love of the, this particular version of Batman, too. But Kevin Conroy. Well, full disclosure, I I know who he is. I know his his legendary status, but I didn't watch uh, the Batman animated cartoons. To be perfectly honest with you, but because I was from, I knew who he was and what he meant to people, and uh, you know his appearance at several conventions I've been at. I, you know, I've heard him speak. I know who he is. Uh, the only animated Batman's I've watched, I think, are the uh, the Dark Knight. Uh, uh, two-part adaptation and the Batman and Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles crossover. <laughs> but uh, I know who he is and uh, I know what he meant to fans and uh, um, what a big loss this is. So, yeah. yeah I, this is a man who definitely made an impact on a lot of fans. I, truthfully, you mentioned it earlier, Peter Cullen, when we talked, Peter Cullen, that he, I think Kevin Conroy and Peter Cullen are maybe probably the two most iconic voice actors of characters in a general within the last 20 to 30 yeah. years. Maybe so. Jim Cummings is the only one I can think comes yeah. even close. Yeah, that I would agree. So I just wanted to make sure we took a moment because the man identified one of the greatest characters of all time in Batman and really defined him for a generation. So thank you, Kevin Conroy, for everything you've done and for the countless adults and children who you gave pleasure with with your performance as Batman. May you rest in peace. Guys, speaking of kind of heavy topics here, we've got a very interesting movie to talk about with Black Panther Wakanda Forever. This film has been maybe highly anticipated. In some cases, people have been a little bit sad to see this film come because of the circumstances around it with Chadwick Boseman. But it's a very powerful film. It's debuted this weekend. So without further ado, let's begin phase one of our journey through Wakanda Forever. <laughs> Thank you. 
Kevin, phase one is always our plot description. Would you be so kind? Be honored to. All right. Plot description for Wakanda forever. T'Challa, king of Wakanda, dies of a disease that his sister Shuri believes could have been cured by the heart-shaped herb. Shuri's been attempting to synthetically recreate the herb after it was destroyed by Killmong, but is unsuccessful. A year later, Wakanda has been under pressure from other countries to share their vibranium with some parties attempting to steal it by force. Ramonda implores Shuri to continue her research on the heart-shaped herb, hoping to create a new Black Panther that will defend Wakanda but she refuses as she believes the Black Panther to be a figure of the past. The CIA uses a new vibranium detection, detecting machine on an expedition to a potential vibranium deposit underwater. The entire search team is then attacked and killed by Namor and his blue-skinned, water-breathing people. But the CIA believes Wakanda was responsible. Namor goes to Ramonda and Shuri, easily bypassing Wakanda's advanced security, he blames Wakanda for the vibranium race and gives them an ultimatum. Find and give him the scientist responsible for the vibranium detecting machine or he will attack Wakanda. Shuri and Okoye, with the help of their friend and CIA agent, Everett K. Ross, go to Boston to meet the scientist responsible, an MIT student named Ruri Williams. The group is chased by the FBI and the Namor's warriors who defeat Okoye and take Shuri and Williams underwater to meet Namor. Ramonda strips Okoye of her duty as the Dora Milaje and seeks out Nakia, who has been living in Haiti since the blip, for help to find Shuri and Williams. Shuri meets Namor, who shows, who shows her his underwater kingdom of Talakon which he has protected for centuries and is rich with vibranium. Bitter at the surface world that once rejected him, Namor offers an alliance with Wakanda against the rest of the world, but promises to destroy Wakanda first if they refuse. Nakia helps Shuri and Williams escape, and Namor retaliates with an attack against the capital of Wakanda, during which Ramonda drowns, saving Williams. Namor vows to return in a week with his full force as the citizens of Wakanda are relocated to the Jabari land for their safety. Meanwhile, Ross is arrested by his ex-wife and director of the CIA, Valentina Allegra de Fontaine, for secretly exchanging classified intelligence with the Wakandans. Shuri uses a remnant of the herb that gave Namor's people their underwater abilities, synthetically reconstructs the heart-shaped herb. After ingesting the herb, Shuri becomes the new Black Panther and meets Killmonger in the ancestral plane, who urges her to seek revenge. Upon returning, she is accepted by the other Wakandan tribes. Despite M'Baku's advice for peace, Shuri is determined to get revenge for Amanda's death and orders an immediate counterattack on Namor. Preparing for battle... And with Ao assuming the role of the general of the Dora Milaje, Shuri bestows the Midnight Angel armor upon Okoye, who in return recruits Anika to join her. The Wakandans use a seafaring vessel, vessel, the Sea Leopard, to set a trap for Namor, luring him and his warriors to the surface, and a battle ensues. Shuri separates Namor from the rest of his people, intending to dry him out and weaken him. The pair crash on a desert island and fight. Shuri eventually gains the upper hand and she realizes the similarities between Wakanda and Telecon and decides to spare Namor's life, offering him a peaceful alliance. Namor accepts and the battle ends. Namor's cousin Namora is upset about Namor yielding to Shuri, but he promises that Shuri's empathy for the people is useful because Wakanda has no other allies in the world. Now safe, Williams returns to Boston, but has to leave her new suit behind. Later, Okoye rescues Ross from captivity. Shuri visits Nakia in Haiti, where she burns her funeral ceremonial robe like her mother wanted, allowing herself to finally grieve. And in a mid credit scene, picking up moments later, Shuri then learns that Nakia and T'Challa have a son, Toussaint who Nakia has been raising in secret, far from the pressure of the throne, and Toussaint reveals his Wakanda name is T'Challa. The end. Guys, this was 
for me, a movie that was carrying a lot of meaning to it. I'm not going to lie. Um, I've said it before, The Death of Chadwick Boseman hit me pretty hard. Usually celebrity deaths like this, but this don't hit me quite this hard or resonate with me. And for some reason, Chadwick Boseman, this kind of death has still been kind of in my mind to the upcoming of this film. So this this was a heavy film. There's a lot of things that Ryan Coogler and company needed to do with this film, including, in a way, letting us all join in their journey, I feel, to say goodbye to Chadwick Boseman, and we'll talk about that a little later. But I want to get each of you a chance to give us your first impressions of the film. After What were your thoughts, those initial thoughts, right after you had watched it? Um, Lacey, I'm going to start with you on this. Okay, I saw it for the first time at uh, 2.15 or something on Thursday, and there were maybe a dozen people in the movie theater uh, because it was the day before. And I was genuinely worried that because there are a couple of really silent scenes. My first thought when the film was over was like, I'm, I really hope nobody heard me sobbing <laughs> throughout the movie because there were so many scenes that were just, they managed to do something that I didn't, everyone was worried that they weren't going to either pay Chadwick Boseman the right amount of tribute or they weren't going to do the character well in the transition and they really pulled it off and um, I cried the whole way through it. Yeah, I, I I can definitely see what you're feeling there with that. There was a lot of emotion in this film. Lee, what about you? Where where were you in your thinking of the after seeing the film for the first time? Um, I was really impressed with it uh, because, uh, like you said, they dealt with um, the passing of Chadwick and the passing of T'Challa in a way that. Um, it happened off camera. It happened before the movie. And you can still feel the weight of it, even if you're looking at it as uh, somebody who may not have seen Black Panther 1. Uh, it actually reminded me a lot of uh, Fast and the Furious 5, where in the previous film, Letty had died. And they begin, and everybody is in this state of pain that kind of lasts through the movie. It's one of the reasons why I didn't like that they brought it back. But um, you don't get a lot of that in the films. Um uh, I believe that they uh, really did some justice by Mbaku. Um, I thought uh, originally I thought he he was kind of the the best choice for Black Panther. Um, however, I do like that he ends up probably becoming king uh, because nobody else is going to challenge him for the throne, and sure he uh, backed out of it. Um, and I think that was kind of a, a interesting way to go. Uh, just watching those two, um, and also uh, Queen Ramonda dealing with. Um, you know, the, the pain, the loss and the, the burdens of leadership um, and just those personal relationships. Um, speaking as somebody who has uh, lost people and didn't find the time to grieve, just that scene, figuring out like, how do I let this go? Uh, that can take a while and that can be uh, something that really hurts. And usually something like that is given lip service. It's not present in every scene in the movie. Uh, that takes um, skilled acting and a really skilled director and DP to to find it uh, because you feel it through most of the characters uh, from Wakanda, even even Ross. I mean, you can tell that there's some pain involved there. Yeah. Kevin, what about you? What, how did you feel after your first viewing of Wakanda Forever? You know, I thought that uh, Letitia Wright is sure he was fantastic in this. Her acting was spot on because her character dealing with the grief the hardest I thought was very interesting because in a way her character was kind of an avatar for us fans uh, lo losing Chad Bozeman. And I love the parallel that they did. They didn't, you know, they just went right into his passing and he died of an illness and they just kind of left it to that, you know, and I, I, I think that was a smart thing to do. Honestly, just, just go right. Just, you know, have him pass away just like we lost uh, Chadwick. It's sad, but it gives us as fans a way to grieve uh, in reality with this, this uh, fantasy world that the MCU is because that's what made it um, very emotional. And that's what made us tear up. And I'll say right now, um, you know, I went to the first screening and it was a 3 15 PM on a Thursday after work. And I was pretty tired, but I, I was, you know, I'm like, I need to do this. I want to do this. Uh, Cause I had been at work at really early and everything, but uh, um, you know, everyone was getting their popcorn and, you know, during the trailers, you know, there was some mummering going on and you can hear, you know, popcorn being eaten, you know, soda being sipped and candy being open. 
And the way this thing opened up with, you know, your normal Marvel fanfare opening up, and it was just nothing but Black Panther and Chadwick Bowman. When that, you know, and that happens after the opening scene of the, um, uh, of the, uh, um, the funeral. And, uh, you could hear a pin drop. Everyone stopped breathing. Everyone stopped eating. Everyone stopped moving. And the same thing happened at the end. You know, um, you know when you when you see Shuri going through her her moment and and, bur and burning the, the the robe and all that kind of stuff. And and then like when the movie kicks in again, people kind of took a breath and were wiping away tears and uh it was just one of the most emotional moments i've experienced watching a movie with a group and uh um i, I overall i enjoyed the movie um i knew it was going to be long i struggled with a little bit with that a little bit i'll explain that later uh but there was a lot to put into it a lot to kind of uh address and soak in and, and introduce so i get it and i understand why uh, but uh, I thought it was a great way to give tribute to um, Chadwick Boseman and, you know, passing the torch and uh, really diving into the Wakanda culture a little bit more, too, I thought was interesting. And the still having the struggles within and the cast was just on point, just fantastic. I agree with everything everybody said here. Um, I'm with you, Kevin. The, from really that first thing when we jump in and we sur see Surrey trying to save T'Challa and then the silence just that from that point through the um, opening Marvel standard with everything being remembrance of Chadwick and it was just silence up until probably even about five more minutes into the film because I think for a lot of people and I've heard this on a couple other podcasts too Kevin listened to including the Midnight Boys when they were watching it, it was like they didn't they knew they were going to have to but they didn't necessarily want to rel relive that moment of hearing about Chadwick Boseman dying. And it felt the same way here with his char character dying off screen. And, you know, I, I when somebody put it perfectly in another podcast I listened to, what was so amazing about particularly the scene between them when uh, Angela Bassett's Rem Queen Mamrunda comes up to tell Surrey that Charles passed. I wouldn't be surprised if those weren't real tears that they were having in that moment. Yeah. I think that... For me, that was one of the biggest things with this movie was is that I think Ryan Coogler and the cast were gracious enough to let us be part of what, them saying goodbye to Chadwick Boseman in this film. The film itself, I think, is very good considering the weight and the structure that it was it was under. Chad um, Ryan Coogler had actually finished the script and had given it to Chadwick Boseman about two weeks before he passed away. And literally, he had gotten a text from Chadwick with a couple of notes, and then he got the text the next day that Ch Chadwick died. So Ryan Coogler had to rewrite a lot of this, basically rewrite the whole script under these circumstances. And I, th that's amazing and unto itself, considering the emotional weight he had to have been carrying through this film. This film does a lot of good things right. It's not a perfect film. It's There's some points in there that are a little bit long, but I think you have one of the best villain performances in this film that we've seen in the MCU in a good while. And I think there's a lot of good things that this film did. And I'm really looking forward to diving into it. And with the, that point in mind, guys, let's focus on the cast because most of this cast had to do this film with a very heavy heart. And I am, I have heard the stories just from comic con and of other places where many a time they had to stop filming for even a couple of days at a time for them to focus on their emotions and get their emotionals in check. But guys, the cast top to bottom was absolutely fantastic, but I got to really um, folk, give a shout out to Angela Bassett, who in my opinion could easily be Oscar nominated for her performance in this film. She, she was strong. She had an emotional presence in this film film. And I, it, there's no question. One of the reasons why she's one of the best actresses in, in, uh, in Hollywood today, but I mean, the cast as a whole, they were phenomenal in the first film and as an ensemble cast, which I think really was the way to go with this was absolutely perfect in this. Um, Kevin, what do you, what, what do you think? Yeah, the, the, the cast was spot on and you're right. Uh, Angela Bassett nailed it. Uh, she, she, she had to be, she had to be the, the, the elder family member in this and really show strength and power. And I loved that, um, that scene in the beginning where she's meeting the, uh, I don't know, what is that, like a, a Senate, not a Senate hearing. The UN. 
yeah, yeah a UN type thing. And uh, I just, I loved how the, the, the strength of force was shown when she came in and she brought in the captured uh, soldiers. I thought that was great. Uh, and just, I've always been a big fan of hers and she was just fantastic in it. And yeah, so, so definitely. Uh, I want to give a shout out to Dominic Thorne as Rory. Uh, Rory, uh, an interesting character to, to introduce. Uh, and Kyle, if I remember correctly, is she what Ironheart? Ironheart, yes. Ironheart. She's the, the name, and she's the one of the newer, younger characters in there. And uh, um, I, I thought that she was uh, a good character to introduce and and and, and jump into it. Uh, Mar Marty Freeman, I love him as Ross. Uh, and finding out that uh, he's and why? <laughs> I thought that was done well. I thought that was great. Uh, I love Winston Duke too as in Baku. I, I I'm glad that he was back. Um, and I got to got to got to got to mention, got to crush in on Lupita a little bit. Just saying, she looked great. She was beautiful. Uh, and uh, I really love that um, Denai Guria is a Koye had her own arc in this. You know, she gets she she. Uh, you know, fails in protecting who she's supposed to protect. And uh, she basically uh, gets stripped of her power and has to go through that. Uh, so, yeah, just a lot of other great uh, characters here. Just loved it. Um, one of the things I really enjoyed about this cast, too, and it's something I feel like, I mean, most Marvel casts are like this. We even talk about this with some Star Trek. Cast. But this cast especially feels so much like family. Mm -hmm. And I guess maybe because it is what happened with Chadwick, bringing them even closer together. You see, at least for me, they echo what their character is, what probably how they were on the set. Angela Bassett having to be this strong person who's been lived life and been through so much, having to carry the rest of the rest of the cast with emotionally. Winston Duke kind of being this bigger big brother who has the broad shoulders for everybody to cry on. Um, that was something that really hit home for me too. Lacey, what about you? How did you feel about the cast? Who were some of your standouts of the cast of the film? Um, I well. I loved everybody. Um, I'm really glad that, that, that Trevor Noah had so much to do this time. Um, I, I loved the fact that um, Shuri's, um, her go-to for her grief was to kind of go into that AI. And, and so she had this, this you know. Jarvis? Friend. Yeah, well, she had a best friend that she created from scratch. So he knew exactly what to say to her. Kind of, I don't know. I, I really loved the fact that when, the queen walks in and she said, and Shuri says, you know, what is my brother's heartbeat? Like the AI doesn't respond because it knows that her mother needs to tell her. Like, mm -hmm. I think that they really did well with Trevor Noah's, um, Gr uh, uh, Grillo is the, is the character's name or whatever. Um, I loved Ironheart uh, when, when Ross said her, uh, he said kid, and he said her in like the scene right beforehand. And there were people in the back of the audience who were like, yes. <gasps> I mean, and it was just so exciting to see, you know, the, just like her backpack as she walked in, it was like, Oh, Oh, are they doing iron? Are, are they doing iron heart? I don't watch trailers. And so I had no idea. I was so excited <laughs> um, to see that, which was really cool. Um, I always love Martin Freeman. He's fantastic. The only character I really hate, is um his ex-wife but i but it, she's the character you love to hate like that's you know um and i do love that they kind of gave Win winston duke a little bit more to do this time um and i loved his costuming out of everybody mm -hmm. don't get me wrong i love the new black, black panther costume we'll get to that later but his his costuming with the the, <clears throat> the gorilla faces and the ape faces it was really cool yeah uh, the, the, uh... Marvel always nails their casting. I, I, there's very few castings Marvel has ever disappointed with me, Lee. How did you feel about the not only the returning cast, but the new cast as well? Um, I really did enjoy it. I thought uh, Riri Williams was uh, excellent. I wish she had had a little bit more to do in because uh, she was basically just making another Iron Man armor. If she had been helping uh, with uh, the genetic sequencing, something like that. I know that's not necessarily her skill set, but... Um, you know, she was one of three people in flying armor. So it wasn't, I, I she was great, but I wish that they, they had used her more. Um, I really did like that uh, we had Okoye and Ayo with uh, very different uh, character arcs and not just supporting, uh, especially with Ayo's arc uh, or inclusion that she had in um, uh, Falcon and the Winter Soldier. 
yeah. that you know she has this other life. Um, I do like the, that uh, her and, uh, and Anika are together. Uh, you know, very very subtle, very like oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, but uh, you know, again, Winston Duke he just did an amazing job um, with uh, Mbaku. Uh, I really do like that they took. Uh, a character that you know, for lack of a better term, was really a caricature in the comic books. I mean, Great Gorilla, you know, is going to be the the uh, the enemy of Black Panther, but they really gave him some animus. Uh, he made several very noble decisions in the first one, and he continued on that. He didn't. They didn't change his character. They actually let it expand. When the the attack happened in Wakanda, everyone else is running away from it, and he's like, "I got to save that guy," and he just jumps in the water. You're like, "Here, hold my stick. I'm going to go kick somebody's butt." Uh, and it was, uh, you know, that kind of thing uh, that really brought it out. Uh, there's two people that you probably wouldn't even mention, but I have to. Uh, Nadia Lorenz and uh, Babatunde Oyewu, uh, two friends and colleagues of mine uh, that were in these uh, films. Nadia, I believe, did stunts. Babatunde was uh, most likely a stunt extra like he was in Black Panther 1. Uh, so really kind of cool. I got to see their pictures from the premiere. They're, they're looking very, very dapper, but, um, I'm just very thrilled that this kind of experience was, uh, able to, uh, for them to have as, as an actor, just the biggest movie this year, you know, they got to, you know, be even a small part of it. It's pretty cool. Yeah, that, that is very cool. Um, one other person I want to throw out in the cast real quick. She had a brief cameo at the beginning of the film was Lake Bell. Mm -hmm. interesting yep. story with Lake Bell she was very much directly affected by the rewrites of this film because of Chadwick's death because there was a there was a plot point with Lake Bell rumored at any rate that was going to lead to a to a different st stinger at the end of this film which would have introduced a new villain to the MCU I think because mm -hmm. of the powerfulness of the stinger which we're going to talk about here in just a minute of this of this movie it, the, the pro producer Nate Moore has said he didn't he talked with Kevin Feige and Kevin Feige agreed they didn't want to take anything away from that stinger by including a second stinger in this one. They felt it was too important and too emotionally powerful. And it was probably one of the most emotionally powerful moments of this film. So guys, I want to talk about that real quick too, is that stinger, that emotional just wave of sadness and joy and excitement. And maybe the cutest kid I've ever seen on screen. Thank you. Um, <laughs> That Kevin, that 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 scene was so emotional, and now we understand, I think, why Kevin Feige was so insistent that they weren't casting T'Challa until, and that now we have this in recasting T'Challa, this version of T'Challa, like because now we have this. You know, it's funny. I rewatched Black Panther today, uh, and I, I like that we get confirmation that obviously there is uh, more than just a. a, a an average relationship between uh, those two characters, uh, T'Challa and um, uh, is it Nakia? I can't remember. Yeah. Right. Yeah, Nakia. Nakia. Uh, and I love that there's something there and that it's produced, uh, you know, a, a child that uh, will obviously uh, grow up and, uh, you know, uh, eventually uh, hoping maybe stake a claim, but I, I like the idea of keeping him secret so that uh, he can grow up as a child in peace. Uh, but uh, when I was watching Black Panther 2, I love the beginning where, um, uh, uh, who is it? Uh, Okoye says, when you see her, don't pause, you know, <laughs> don't, don't freeze. Don't, don't freeze. Yeah. Don't yeah. freeze. Yeah. And of course he freezes, which is it's funny. <laughs> I never freeze. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was cool. Yeah. Yeah, Lee, in this scene too, I think it made so much sense the explanation they gave why she didn't come back for the funeral, those things, and the fact that Queen Ramunda knew actually did know about this child before she passed as well. I think they just handled this absolutely perfect for not only because of the of the emotion of the moment, but for storytelling purposes as well. Mm -hmm. And I think um, something that may have flown over the heads of uh, a majority of uh, the audience that looks like us. Uh, the name of uh, T'Challa's son, or his Haitian name, uh, Toussaint. Um, that is a very important name. Toussaint Louverture was uh, kind of the founding father of Haiti. Um, he was uh, born free, became a slave, I believe, twice. Um, but he uh, fought against the French um, and liberated the island. Uh, so that we have, you know, uh, both of these very powerful names 
uh, Toussaint and Black Panther. I mean, when you think about what those uh, names mean to, uh, you know, the black community, uh, it's uh, a very powerful inclusion. And, and uh, sure, even said that's a very um, important name. Uh, and I think the they probably uh, kicked it around, tried to figure out, okay, what's what are we going to call him? Because T'Challa would have been too easy. Uh, but Toussaint, I think, is the right way to introduce a character like him. Um, I do wish that they had pulled the lip down and shown the the thing or something like that. Uh, I think that would have been uh, a nice little touch. But you don't necessarily want to inject metal into a, a six-year-old. So I understand why they didn't. But I think um, a, as much as I love Lake Bell and always have, uh, I think that not having her be the stinger was the definitely the right way to go. Yeah. Yeah. Um... Lacey, I saw your joy as I was bringing up the cutest kid ever in the MCU. Um, oh, he was adorable. Uh, th- to me, this as as emotionally powerful as the opening was, and even the final scene before the trailers with Shuri. Th- this is the one that you could just hear the audible gasp and the, the kind of it was one of those gasps of like joy and happiness from the audience when I was the audience I was in. Um, this was a this was a wonderful moment, and yet you you were crying. If you were crying, you were crying because you had some tears of joy going on. Um, yes, I saw it the, I saw it today again, uh, again, again. Um, and the cutest thing as I'm walking out of the theater, this little kid behind me who had a lisp said, Mommy, he had a lisp. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. I was like, I thought I finished crying when I was inside the theater. <gasps> oh, he was adorable. Um, and I was so happy that you brought up Lake Bell too. Although I will have a question for our armor. Um, because I've seen this movie uh, several times at this point, um, Lake Bell, I'm trying to figure out how she reloaded because she shot 14 times and then another 22 without changing a clip. And that was upsetting to me. <laughs> I was like, it's, oh, it's, it's Lake what Bell. She does it. It's not that you don't even worry about it. It's like, right? um, <laughs> here, here's the thing. If she's firing a, a uh, for bring now, she now 5.7, you can actually go up okay. to uh, 40 rounds. Oh, good. Uh, I don't know that she was firing, but if she's firing a 5.7 millimeter, uh, and we are also in a world that is post uh, uh, snap and blip. So uh, firearms have probably advanced uh, quite a bit because they're not just dealing with people anymore. Although they didn't really deal with uh, the uh, the uh, the Navi. Uh, I forgot their their name in this movie, but the Talcons. Uh, the Talcons, yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, but. Uh, there we go. There's our plot armor. No, that's fair. I yeah. love Lake Bell. She can do no wrong. She's been in so many awesome things. And I love the fact that out of everyone, she just has this relaxed thing that she does where, she, you know, at one point she was like, okay, we'll fix it up here. And it was just, she she just has a very, very kind of classic relaxed way of acting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. That yeah. is always the same no matter what character she plays. She doesn't play herself every time. It's not like that. It's just like she's just she just relaxes into every character she plays, and I love it. I was a little bummed that she appeared to die, and I was just kind of hoping maybe she might, you know, pull out her Ivy skills or something. So it, it happened off screen. You know, we <laughs> don't know. Off screen in a comic book movie, Kevin. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. If Darth Maul can come back, Lake Bell can come back. All right. uh, well, not to beat a dead horse, but everyone should go see In a World, uh, where she plays yes! a, uh, a voiceover, like the the guy, the guy or the gal that does all the movie intros. She wins like the big one, and her dad was In a World, so it's a great well, movie. Guys, my, my my vibranium tesseract is building up some energy here, which tells me it's time to move on to phase two. So give me a minute. I got to bleed off a little of this energy. Kevin, you Kevin, you okay over there? I know you got a tesseract behind you, so <laughs> yeah. sure you're you're doing good. It's time for a little trivia, guys. We got some very interesting pieces of trivia for this film. This is the 30th film of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I, I got a question real quick before you go any further, because uh, Lee has a a better uh, pronunciation than most of us because uh, of his language skills. How would you uh, pronounce uh, the lead actor's name who played Namor? Um, it's Tenoch, and I've, I'm forgetting his last name. Huerta. 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 Tenoch okay. Huerta. Yeah. Yeah. Tenoch. Okay. I, I was trying to figure out where I'd seen him before. I'm like, oh, yeah. Uh, Purge Forever. He was in that. <laughs> Forever Purge. <laughs> Speaking of Tenoch Huerta, <coughs> he plays the ruler of Namor. Um, 
he didn't know how to swim before this movie. When Ryan Coogler offered him the role and asked him about his swimming square, skills, Squirt simply replied, I've never drowned before. <laughs> he took swimming lessons afterwards in preparation for the role. <laughs> I, that, that's what I call like carefully doing a, uh, a Joey from friends type of, uh, you know, job description of what he can or can't do, you know, <laughs> uh, exactly. another, little, exactly another, in, another interesting fact about Tenek Huerta in this film. He's the first ever actor to be in the, in the um, billing introducing Tenak Huerta. Mm-hmm. He's the first mm-hmm. ever actor in the MCU to be introduced in that, in that manner. Um, mm-hmm. All the actors who were playing Talakan learned a Mayan language for the film. So can, can I, I'm sorry, can I mention something? Else, <coughs> Kyle? So you know how in the end of Miss um, Marvel, we get teased with the mutant gene mention. Yes. He straight up says I'm a mutant. <laughs> yeah, we're we're going to get to that. I, I promise you, Kevin, we're going to get to that because that's a very important okay. thing. Um, Daniel Kaluuya was set to return as Wakabi, but dropped out due to his scheduling conflicts with the movie Nope. Um, before being cast as Ironheart, Dominic Thorne, who played Reeve Williams, initially auditioned to play Suri in the first Black Panther film. Mm. So interesting there. With the runtime of 161 minutes, this will be the second longest film in the MCU behind Avengers Endgame, which had a runtime of 181 minutes and the longest solo MCU film dethroning. I don't know if I call this a solo MCU film, but it's dethroned Eternals, Kevin, as the second longest film. Wow. With, I with would just people, that's not a solo. I yeah. would just measure it as in naps, how many naps you can take. That's what I do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Interesting, right, a little interesting casting couch here. Um, Michael Phelps, Daniel Day Kim, Brian T, Dwayne Johnson, and David Boreanaz were all considered for No More before being, and also Simu Lu was also uh, considered before being cast as Shang Chi. Um, interesting. Um, he, he was also up apparently for the possibility of the X Men character Sunfire somewhere down the line as well. But I, Michael Phelps. I, well, I think we understand why there. But. <laughs> That's too easy. That is too easy. I could see Boreanaz doing it. Yeah, yeah, I, I, could, see, I, could, I could see him doing it. Speaking of right. Boreanaz, is that Boreanaz behind you there, Kevin? Yes, it is. It is Puppet Angel right over here. <laughs> You're a bloody puppet. <laughs> Finally, in the trivia, director Brian Coogler revealed that the sequel's original story was going to focus on T'Challa after the events from Avengers Endgame, with Chadwick Boseman reprising his role and saying that Namor was always the film's antagonist. I, a little bit more on this from other stories I've heard in other readings. It was really going to focus on T'Challa having a very hard time dealing with his time loss from being blipped out mm-hmm. and how it affected him emotionally and his abilities as King having missed those five years. So it's been very interesting to see how that played out. Any thoughts on any of these trivia guys? No. Okay. Yeah. Well, <laughs> there we go. That's They're always pretty straightforward. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, guys, we're going to take a quick break, tell you what else is going on around the Fandom Podcast Network. And when we come back, we're going to do a little bit deeper dive into some of the plot points of the film. Thank you for listening. We hope you're enjoying this podcast. Here are the other great shows on the Fandom Podcast Network. Culture Clash, where we discuss the latest in entertainment and pop culture. Blood of Kings, our show covering the entire Highlander universe. Couch Potato Theater, we celebrate our favorite movies. And Time Warp, our fandom flashback show discussing a year in movies and our favorite retro movie, TV, and pop culture topics. Good evening, discussing all things Alfred Hitchcock. Hair Metal Podcast, we cover the rock metal music of the 80s and early 90s. Type 40, a Doctor Who podcast, discussing the time-traveling Doctor Who universe. Lethal Mullet, an action film podcast, covering the 80s, 90s, and beyond. Also, check out the Lethal Mullet Network for more great podcasts. What a Piece of Junk, our Star Wars podcast. Making Treks, a Star Trek podcast, with a deep dive into the final frontier. The Fandom Show, our Fandom Podcast Network live YouTube show discussing the hottest topics in fandom. The True Believers MCU podcast, discussing the Marvel Cinematic and Television Universe. Union Federation, our Star Trek and the Orville show. And we're proud to welcome the BQN Network to the Fandom Podcast Network. Please visit our friends on the BQN Network, a Star Trek Universe podcast that also includes your favorite topics, movies, history, superheroes, and more. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on YouTube. 
The Fandom Podcast Network is also on all major podcast platforms. The Fandom Podcast Network audio master feed is on Podbean at fpnet.podbean.com. You can find the Fandom Podcast Network on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. You can email us at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com. Thank you so much for listening, and remember, respect others and enjoy your fandom. Welcome back, everybody. It's time to dive into Phase 3 as we are here talking about Black Panther Wakanda Forever. And it's time to talk about some of the plot points of Black Panther. And the first conversation I want to get into, guys, is Chadwick Boseman. Um, Obviously, we were all stunned by the incredible loss of Chadwick Boseman between these two films. Um, A beloved actor, um, an even better human being. And this film carried that weight. And I think it carried it very well. Um, I want to hit a few points about Chadwick Boseman and his effect on the filming of this movie before we get into our conversation. Um, Ryan Coogler nearly stepped away from the project after Chadwick Boseman's death um, due to how emotionally painful it was losing his friend and, as he has said, his hero. However, taking his final conversations with the man into consideration, Coogler decided it was best to keep moving forward with the project. It was also announced that the role of T'Challa would not be digitally recreated and not recast out of respect for Chadwick Boseman's legacy. Um, Ryan Coogler has stated that making this film without Chadwick Boseman is the hardest thing he has ever done. Chadwick Boseman's brother, Derek Boseman, has spoken out against the idea of retiring the character of T'Challa rather than recasting. He believes that his brother wouldn't have been so egotistical as to want the character to die with him and would instead want the character's journey to continue. Interestingly enough, Chadwick Boseman initially signed up for a five-picture deal with Marvel Studios back in 2014. This film would have been his final contractual appearance in live action as the Black Panther in the MCU. Grief and how to deal with grief is something that was a very powerful theme in this movie, guys. Um, Mainly through Shuri, who went through a lot more grief than I think any of us were expecting. Because I don't know about you guys, but the death of Queen Ramonda was a very surprising plot element to me. But not having Chadwick in this movie and how they handled it. We've talked about it a little bit, but how do you guys feel that they dealt with this? Because I know for me, it really did feel like Ryan Coogler and the actors, this film was a way not for only them to say goodbye to Chadwick, but they allowed us, the viewers to join them in that process when I when watching this film. Um, Kevin, I'm going to start with you on this and how you felt watching this film, knowing Chad, what we were doing with, with having lost Chadwick. You know, I've lost people in my life, and one of the most therapeutic things you can do is talk about it with your friends and people that care about the situation and that are close to you in the situation uh, and getting perspectives on how to deal with that. And I think that in a way, making this sequel is a big therapy session, uh, not just for fans, but for everyone involved, including Ryan Coogler. And I can understand him not wanting to do this. And there was a lot of weirdness about what was going to happen. Were they going to try to do any digital thing? Were they going to, and that was all talked in the beginning, you know, uh, how are they going to talk about passing uh, the, the, the legacy of the, of this character? And, you know, Technically, they were able to obviously address that uh, in the first film and how, you know, and explain, you know, how the title of, you know, the leader of Wakanda and and the Black Panther, you know, moves uh, from person to person and, you know, stuff like that. But, um, yeah, it it is uh, losing losing people in real life is a tough thing. It really is. And when you think about how people are invested in the MCU, like we are as fans and why we have podcasts that we talk about it, why we buy the figures, why we buy all the movies when they come out and and watch them and go to midnight premieres uh, or, you know, as soon as you, it opens up for the weekend, we're invested in this world and thus the people that play them, you know, we see them at conventions and Chadwick was a huge loss because of, of not just what Black Panther is in the MCU, but when you look at his uh, resume for the films that he's done, he's a fantastic actor. And uh, it's 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 a sad thing to know that we're not going to get any more um, work from him. 
but as fans, um, we can, uh, you know, watch the movies that he's in MCU or not and celebrate him in our hearts in that way. Yeah. I think those are all excellent points. Lacey. One of the things too, with Chadwick was how much he valued the character of T'Challa. I mean, especially when the first film came out, he was everywhere and he carried this with a lot more importance. And I think most of the other actors who, I'm not saying they don't value those roles, but, he carried T'Challa with a to- at a totally other level throughout everything with Black Panther and just his presence on screen as, as T'Challa, especially in the Black Panther film was so powerful, but yet in an understated kind of way, he didn't blow everybody else out of the water around him. And it's, it's weird because while I think this movie did do a phenomenal job of dealing with everything with, to, with Chadwick's passing, just, did you feel like there was still a little bit of a hole with it, not him being part of this? Well, I mean, of course, but I think that the 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 thing that they did so well was addressing it from several different points of view. Um, I mean, Shuri is basically an atheist, and you know they they spend a, a considerable amount of time um, questioning people, like showing people questioning their own, you know thoughts um you know when they when they realize that there may have been another meteorite or another meteor um and then all of a sudden you know Akoya is like wait a minute that that completely changes so many things you know the the religion you know with the big mound and you know all of the fables and the stories and everything else you know those things are seared into my brain and Siri's response was well that sounds uh what was it that sounds painful or whatever I mean she's it's interesting, you know, the, when she goes in to be the Black Panther, she goes and she sees uh, Michael B. Jordan and, and, you know, he's like, you didn't believe in this stuff. Who were you expecting to find? Or what, why did you drink the herb? Um, so I like the fact that they kind of looked at it from several different points of view, as far as religion goes. Um, but they did it throughout the film. He, there was never more than 15 minutes of a two hour and 41 minute movie where he wasn't brought up. Yeah. And I think they did that very, very well. Yeah, no, I think those are all good points. Mm-hmm. Lee, I think one of the things too that hit me hard was just the fact he died of a disease in the movie as well. They did mm-hmm. they they hit you square on with reality in, in a fantasy film in this. And I, I know it kind of I kind of took my breath away for a minute when they when we see that he's dying of a disease unknown disease. And it just in a way it felt like yes, you are saying goodbye to Chadwick all over again. How do you think they handled it? from your perspective with Chadwick's death and how they worked it within the film? Um, I think the, the best part is they recognized all the ways that um, T'Challa and the Black Panther is important in a way that also respected how important uh, Chadwick was. Um, when <clears throat> this movie first came out, uh, it was kind of touted, uh, especially within the MCU, but it's the first superhero movie with a black lead where he wasn't um, a monster, a criminal, or really a sidekick, um, especially within the MCU. Um, you know, you've got uh, whether uh, Luke Cage was or wasn't a criminal, you know, I mean, he he was incarcerated. So he is playing to that stereotype. Um, with Blade, he is a monster. With Rhodey, he is... Really, you know, as much as he is his own man, he is played as a sidekick to Iron Man. Uh, this is somebody that stands on his own and who is also free from um, the generational trauma of the black experience really in the rest of the world. Um, if we look at it, it's we're not the only bad actors in that in uh, here, but it's um, and to counterpoint uh, Black Panther, this, you know, powerful, proud, you know, generationally um, af- affected um Black character with somebody like Killmonger, who represents everything that has happened to, uh, to Black society um, by playing the power of his loss, that he was this example of something free from those bonds. Uh, I think probably the strongest moment of that um, was really that moment in the UN where uh, Queen Ramonda is kind of talking and everyone's like, well, we've heard that uh, vibranium uh, can be used as a weapon of mass destruction and you can't detect it in an airport, you know, like, how are we going to do this? And then uh, you bring in these mercenaries and you see that, oh, 
they're respecting how important he was too by realizing now we can move. They thought that he was the only the only powerful force, uh, and they didn't realize that this was a strong country and that these people are attempting to uh, again self define in this new world uh, dealing with it. I thought it was uh, probably the most powerful and brilliant moment um, in the movie because the other ones are expected. Uh, yeah. You know, you expect that scene by the fire, you know, the, the mother daughter talking about the loss. So, you know, uh, both of them, really, it, you didn't expect that one. Um, and I think recognizing that uh, the real politic of the world allowed them to have this relationship between uh, Namor and uh, the Black Panther, where they respect each other. But there's this antagonism because of what the world does. Uh, I don't think... Uh, I don't think another director could have found that. I think Googler really figured out how to do it right. Yeah, I, I, that's all good points. Guys, I want to talk next, though, about Letitia Wright, because she had a weight that was just incredible to carry throughout this film, not only in the performance, but just because unexpectedly she's taken over as kind of the main mantle of the Black Panther of this film. Um, I want to quote this from some of the things I pulled from this film. After Chadwick Boseman's untimely death, some fans have ad advocated for the next Black Panther film to follow the comics and to have Suri, T'Challa's sister, take on the role as the new Black Panther. A lot of people had pretty much assumed that, but that was a lot of weight. And Letitia had a pretty tough time. She was mourning the death of Chadwick Boseman. She went through some issues with Marvel. And the, during the filming of this, she had a severe injury during the filming of this movie mm -hmm. that actually delayed the filming of this movie. But the performance she gives in this film with dealing with all of the grief, not only for the character and losing her brother and her mother and her father, really not that long. We've in, in the, in the, in the first film. And then all of a sudden she's almost the queen of her people and she's taking on the totem of the black Panther, but she's taking it on. And I think this was one of the most brilliant moments of the film to have Michael B. Jordan return as Killmonger in the ancestral plane and the explanation of why she was seeing Killmonger in the astral plane, because she was seeking vengeance. She wasn't looking to def necessarily defend her people. It was a secondary thought. Her primary goal was vengeance. And as part of the grieving process until the end of the film in her fight, final fight with Namor, where she kind of realizes that vengeance isn't necessarily the proper answer for this. And it still even a ways feels a little bit begrudgingly. And then the fact that she kind of, as Lee said, skirts her responsibilities because maybe she's not ready for it, whatever. But it was an outstanding performance by Letitia Wright, guys. And I just, we, I want to give you guys each a chance to kind of comment on that. Lacey, why don't you go ahead and start with this? Okay. Um, well, first of all, I think that she carried a, a significant portion of the movie. I think that, you know, it was, it was kind of, it was a, a strong it was i don't know it, it seemed like an ensemble but it was it she had a very strong lead character kind of lead character vibe um i love the fact that when they when she made her suit um you had the gold from killmonger and the silver from Ch uh, from chichala and this the gold was up next to her head but the silver was in the center where her heart would be um, so I think that kind of, I don't know if the costume costumers had any thoughts, you know, with that, mm -hmm. but, um, I thought that was kind of an interesting thing. And again, I still think that the idea that she had, you know, she created a best friend out of her, you know, AI, um, in a, in a much different way than Tony had Jarvis. I think that that was, um, an interesting character point for her. Lee, what about your your thoughts on her performance in this film, because I, I think it, it, it was so much, it was so much she had to take on. Uh, yeah. And I think that without the performance that she gave in black Panther one, um, if she had been a smaller character, you know, just sidelined by 10% or if her performance in one had been 10% less, uh, I don't think it would have worked, but the, what we see in black Panther one, the brightness, the, the this the snotty little sister um and i got two of those and i got a snotty older sister but uh <laughs> just the that relationship the fun um and you know just the the youth and the exuberance and the confidence removing that 
from her character made it work. Uh, like I said, I was rooting for Winston Duke. I was rooting for Mbaku. Um, I thought that there was notes in Black Panther 1 that said, yeah, he's he should be the one. Uh, her performance changed my mind. Um, and I think that it literally does rely on just the joy that we know her uh, from, you know, Black Panther 1 and, you know, her uh, small part in um, Infinity War. Uh, to to see that removed and to... I honestly didn't quite recognize her in the opening scene or the scene when she was in the lab. It, it seemed like a different person. Um, and then you see the moments where she's trying to be, you know, kind of fun and, you know, give crap to uh, Okoye. And it's not the same as when she was giving her brother crap. It's like, she's trying to dig her way out. And it's the only way she knows, but she's not confident. And it was that journey it, on on the subtle levels, the stuff that I recognize as an actor, like all the choices that you make, she just did it so well uh, that she was able to change my mind. And uh, even, you know, she was kind of, you know, uh, had some interesting opinions that we don't need to get into on here. But I think she changed a lot of people's minds. Um, and I'm very interested to see what she does next. Yeah, I think, I think that's a lot of questions for a lot of people. Kevin, what what about you? I mean... We've all experienced loss, but I mean, the, the level of loss that the character experiences on top of what the actor is ex feeling herself, I mean, to pull off this performance was, in my opinion, just astonishing for, for one, such a young actress, and two, just for the emotion that she probably carried throughout the entire film. A little shot of reality here, guys. The grief, not acting. Yeah, you think about no. it. Mm -mm. Uh, you know that you I mean you're pulling from reality there and uh, um, you know but uh, yeah and I was I was feeling uh, uh, Letitia's uh, role in that and but you know uh, when I was listening to the comments that Lee said and how she was you know she's she was different you know whether it's you know how pain can kind of uh, she seemed a little more um, uh, you know not mature or grown up, but just a little more, um, I guess hardened? just, yeah, maybe hardened something that, you know, when you have loss and what people have gone through with the, the blip and everything the snap, uh, and, you know, I, and I like the comments that Lacey said, um, about how she doesn't have the faith in, you know, that everyone else might have and that, you know, you know, and in, in that, you know, in the original uh, Black Panther, you know, the Dora Milaje have to, um, you know, serve whoever is in charge, you know, and in a way that kind of implies that you don't question it. And yet she's questioning it and she has reason to. And, and I like that uh, she was able to pull that off. And I, I like her scientific mind. I like it when she gets in her element. I liked it. I like the scenes when, you know, she went to, uh, um, uh, Boston area in the the scenes with Ironheart and and, uh, and Riri and all that and, and you know, even the, even the moments with uh, with Ross I thought were great too and I, I felt that she was becoming a lead she was becoming a lead that we can follow in a future film even more and and uh, I think that's an important mantle that you know I think you know Lee and some other fans were like myself were like can she do this and she can. And uh, I'm proud of her, and uh, I was feeling her pain. Yeah. Um, it, was, it was very powerful all the way around. Um, speaking of powerful guys, we haven't really addressed our villains so much of this film. And there's a point where I want to tie in some comic things here, too, because we, we had Tena Cuerta as Namor. Um, he, Namor, of course, in the comics, is the ruler of the undersea realm of Atlantis. Um, the film in Acres one of the reasons they changed the name was to avoid connections and comparisons with Atlantis in the Aquaman film and for some diversity things too, to show that there is more culture to the MCU um, and going with the realm uh, Talacon after the Aztec underwater realm of Taliacon. Um, the concept of a Mesoamerican underwater kingdom is based on the concept of Aztlan, a mystical home that arranged originated the Aztec people and was said to be another name for Atlantis. Um, Guys, I'm going to tell you right now. I don't know how who Lee who who's, how much of you guys are familiar with Namor. 
But outside of the change kind of going with these uh, South American Mayan connections, I really think they captured the spirit of Namor here and Tenok did a phenomenal job as Namor because he was the villain of this film, but yet you had some sympathy for him. You had some sympathy. He's a man trying to protect his people. Also, a credit to the MCU. They took the craziest thing about Namor, the ankle wings, and they put them full front forward. And mm -hmm. this is a character that a lot of people said, well, they're not going to do this, this green suit and ankle wings. But they did. And I just think that they they did a phenomenal job with uh, Namor, Namor in this and actually really even added more to the character. What were your guys' feeling on Namor and as the villain? This thing? Lee, I'm going to start with you on this. Um, I, I'm familiar with the character originally, you know, I read, uh, some of my uncle's comic books when I was a kid, uh, not one that I'm, uh, that's Kevin, not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, not one that I'm particularly, uh, you know, fond of or attached to, but, uh, when they, they did this, they did it right. And I think the, the changing of the name gives it a bit more weight, gives it a bit more, uh, reason for him to be the way he is. Uh, you know, El Niño Sin Amor, uh, A Child With No Love. Uh, you know, to take Sin Amor, No Love, and just go with Namor. Uh, that's a better than like, oh, yes, Namor is uh, our uh, our word for vengeance. Um, it actually gives some connection to the world, uh, which I thought really had a, a, a good way to go around it. Uh, and like you said, uh, he once you kind of accept the change of this, it uh, makes a lot of sense. And I wanted to get back to something Lacey said about uh, what if there was another meteor strike? Uh, we've been dealing with uh, the gods in uh, phase four a lot. And we're dealing with the mythology and what uh, everyone has believed is true, uh, both with the Eternals and uh, Thor, Love and Thunder. And to have just another challenge to what we believed or what, uh, you know, Earth 616 believed, uh, I think is an interesting way to finish out the cycle and also to bring people together because these are uh, two cultures that were able to exist isolated from the rest of the world for a very long time that are advanced, that are happy and healthy people that also recognize the threat of the rest of the world and are attempting to deal with it in very different ways. And really Namor uh, is a, uh, responding in the way that uh, Killmonger had prior. Yeah. Lacey, what about you? What were your thoughts on Namor in this film and how he was portrayed? Well, first of all, I got to tell you, for like a little minute there, when they were underwater, I was kind of like, are they getting ready to ship Shuri and Namor? Like, is that is this com is that thing going to happen? Like, And then, of course, you know, he killed Mom, so that's not going to happen. But yeah. um, I, I, I'm... I know that we've been talking about, and I, I'm going to say his name wrong again. Tell me his name again. Tino Huerta. Tino Huerta. Yeah, okay. So I, we, I loved him, but the kid, the young, the young kid, that like that character was brutal. I mean, he legit set everything on fire and then had a funeral. Like everything's burning around him, and he's just going about his business, bearing his mud. Like you know, t t t like it's hard to pull that kind of thing off and still remain a like a genuine character, but I loved that kid. Um, and I think that it's interesting that you have Wakanda. And I think this generally what Lee was saying, you know, that you have two societies that were basically unknown to the world for quite a while. Um, and the rest of the world is basically the bad guy at this point, you know, so there's, there's always that possibility that he was going to convince her to, you know, team up for just that minute, you know, minute or two in the middle there. Um, also, I think that Namor now becomes the easiest costume for next Halloween. Like, legit, go pick up some boxer briefs <laughs> and um, you're good to go uh, with some big jewelry. Um, I, I'm not familiar with any of the comics. I don't know. Um, I don't know a lot about it. It was Namor was it was Namor the Submariner, right? Yeah. A yeah, yeah. No, Namor, Namor was the Submariner. Namor okay. was actually one of the first heroes ever introduced in Marvel co comics. It was him, the original okay. Human Torch, and um, actually, if, technically, if you want to get technical, Captain America with a lot of the World War II comics and and things like yeah. that. But Namor, Namor was one of the, and he was 
and I'll, I'll get to this Kevin too. Namor was the first okay. mutant in the in in Marvel history. Gotcha. So. Okay. So so my thing is that I think that he, I think that when you go back and you watch it the second and third time, you realize that he's been playing her from the very beginning. Um, you know, you see that final scene where he's talking to Namora and a, a t- Atuma. 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 Yeah. And, uh, and he's saying, you know, look, we have her support. We have her sympathy now. So this is, this is good for us. You know, so you look back at everything else he said to her. And even in the cave when she's sitting there saying, you know, my brother suffered in silence. And, you know, why would I be given these tools where I can help him but not in time and all that kind of stuff. And Namora is, is you know, has the you know, the concerned look and everything else. And then she wants to see his kingdom. And he's like, he's got this like super dark side. And then all of a sudden he goes, or you could wear a suit, (laughs) you know, like, um, so he's, he's, he's very charming. Um, but I think that he's also very disarming and not in the good way. Yeah. I, 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 all very good points and actually all points that are very common within the character of Namor, the Submariner. Mm -hmm. Kevin, what about you? What were your thoughts on Namor in this film? Uh, I don't know anything about his comic history. I, I, uh, a lot of these characters, I just know through the MCU and that's why I'm an MCU fan because, uh, that's what I follow. I, I don't go back and read the comics. And so I think it's important. What's important for me is how well they introduce them for people like us that aren't familiar with the character. And I thought it was a really cool idea, especially with the whole, uh, you know, um, kind of Aztec background and in the history that we get with the character and uh the culture that we see with with uh, his people uh and it, it makes sense for the mcu and of course the changes they made to you know have no confusion with aquaman but it makes sense that if you're going to have a, a, a earthly world with superheroes uh, whether it's mutants, like uh, he basically says that he is, that someone be from the water. And, you know, the water it takes up most of the earth and there's a lot of it that's unexplored. And I am glad that, that, that we get to a character that can now, you know, be the leader of that part of uh, the world in the MCU. Uh, the only question that I, I don't know if it's an issue or if only seeing it once uh, and maybe I need to see it more. And so maybe Lacey, uh, you can clarify or if anyone else knows I, I'm, was there any reference to how uh, Namor um, and his people were affected during the blip? I didn't see anything specific, Okay, um, but the- yeah, I don't think they didn't bring it up. So I don't know if there's, they might. I, that that was there. my, only, that was my only issue because I think the trauma that everyone who survived the the blip um, should kind of be brought into question. And I think it's important that that, or I think that was just one of the little things that bugged me that that was kind of omitted because one of the problems that I had with his, his character and act of vengeance was because of the ancient history And we have a little uh-oh. freeze up here with Kevin. That. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Oh, oh, oh. We're good. Um, I, well, we're waiting on Am Kevin. I back? To, Am I back? back uh, okay. Uh, you, were the, you, had, you had a little telekin interference, but I think you're good. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I was having, what I was going to say was I was having an issue with his revenge, basically, to the, the people above. Okay. And I, I, I understand you know, why he was bringing Wakanda into it and the writers were, but I'm trying to figure out why all of a sudden the people above the water he wants revenge on was stuff that happened so long ago. And, you know, why then his people were, were, you know, went to the water and all that kind of stuff. I, I I just, I, I was just having a little issue with the development of that. He was good the set decoration was good. The people and the costumes and, and, and introducing that world was good. But when you introduce a villain um, like Killmonger and his reason for revenge and have you, I, I just, that was a little thin for me because of this past that happened before the blip, before everything. I, I just, I guess I wanted something a little more, mm, I don't know if the word's concrete, but I, I, you know, I don't know. Did anyone else have an issue with that? Is that Me? the only one? 
Lee, you got yourself on mute, but. Uh, I think what happened uh, and it might've got lost in editing, but he's really uh, comparing uh, the mining ship coming for uh, vibranium in his kingdom to uh, the uh, conquistadors who came to Mexico to uh, strip the mine. He knows what happens next. I get uh, that. He saw that. I, I get that, but this, I I'm getting a world domination vibe from him regarding uh, the use of controlling the vibranium. Mm -hmm. And I, I, you know, and I see what the conquistadors did that if you do your history with that, that was bad stuff. That was really yeah. bad stuff. But I just, with the time and I'm sorry, but the blip affected everyone. I just wish yeah. that there was something tied to the blip that might've triggered the reason why he's doing his thing now. That makes well, sense. I mean, he's, he's again, got explorers mining his stuff with military personnel. I mean, it's, it's a very direct parallel to uh, the most traumatic event in his life. Right. Uh, right. And I, I think that's, you know, the blip, I mean, we've kind of been over it for a while now. Uh, you know, they kind of left it out of a lot of things or it's just kind of casually mentioned in Thor. Uh, I think it's it's there, but I think they could have shown a light on it a little bit more. And they Wait. did say one thing about time what time for him was when she asked him, she said this, this she was talking about the bracelet. And she said, um, this is obviously 16th century. Have you been alive that long? And there was a little conversation about you know, what led into his, his history. That was the, the very beginning little blip, little piece of it. Um, but I don't know if that was kind of the way of saying that his people weren't, maybe weren't affected by the blip perhaps because he didn't bring that up. It was kind of a direct question about kind of important. I'm just, I'm just mm -hmm. saying that that needed to be addressed and it wasn't. You know, Kyle? I, I, I think Kevin too, part of it is, is that I know the MCU is trying to move a little bit forward from the blip, but also too, because of, their own background and the things they've been through for a bunch of their people to just disappear while yes, it's scary. And I don't think he necessarily, they, they, there was a necessarily blame of the, of the surface world because they had no, there was no evidence of the surface world's involvement. And I think they were like, we're not going to expose ourselves after, after something like this to where in this film, the surface world is coming to them and the surface world is basically invading them. Like Lee said, much like the conquistadors. And because they are obviously aware. There's obviously some awareness of what's going on on the surface world because Namor talks about Wakanda revealing themselves and their vibranium. And it's because of them not sharing their vibranium with the rest of the world that they're now invading his country to co coming after the vibranium. And that's what's got him. If they it wouldn't have happened, they would have been fine just existing unknown. So I think it was just something to where they re they're revealing themselves because They've been discovered in a way been discovered. The, the world domination thing that he he's leading towards. I, I just, I still have an issue with, I, I, it's just to me, that was a trope that should have been flushed out a little bit more. That was my only issue. And, and I, I still haven't, I still haven't seen an argument that has, you know, said I get being threatened. I get, you know, he has his own stash. I get that. And, you know, I mean, it, now you want to do it, you know, because of the vibranium and the history of the past. I, 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 I just, that's my, only I, I think he feels it. directly assaulted. And I think now that he, he knows that he, his cut, his, his society has been exposed and there's at least aspects of the governments now that know about it and stuff like, so now he's starting to play the political games and his eventual end goal is to get that domination, but he's not, He's going to play it through some political angles. And I think this is something that's going to actually end up being. See, a that's the thing. That His might... society wasn't exposed. He brought him. He 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 came out. They came out against They it. were getting and, too close for his company. Yeah. yeah. But if they're, yeah. If they're getting but, into that, know, they, they they're going to be They in didn't his have to backyard. go to Boston and show themselves. You know, I mean, I, I don't know. It was just the. I, I, they did have to stop the, the ability to make another one. Yeah. Yeah. So. And also, I will say this: I do agree that, like, in my notes from the second time I saw it, it literally—I I wrote down Namor's a dick. She literally said, "Let's try and find a peaceful, you know, a peaceful way to do this." <laughs> yeah, you—you you would think that if like, a leader like that is going to be a leader for that long, and everyone still revere him, meaning that he has a sense of passion, he has a sense of sympathy, mm -hmm. he has a sense of 
he has these abilities where he's not a tyrant. He didn't come across as a tyrant, which makes me his reasoning of why he was doing things and not listening and considering peaceful and stuff like that. Because in his world, he was beloved. He was basically Black Panther underwater in the way that people love him. So that's why I'm having an issue with him all of a sudden. I'm Revenge Man out of the water. You know, I just, I didn't buy that type of thing the way that it was portrayed because. Did you buy it though in um, Civil War when Black Panther did the same thing? What, Chadwick Boseman? Yeah, when he went on the big uh, revenge thing. I mean, he went he went after Bucky, uh, you know, pretty hardcore, ready to kill him, you know, extrajudicially. Yeah, and he went through that story arc, you know, he got yeah. the revenge thing out of it. You know, he went through his story arc. But I just, I, I don't know, for someone that is revered in that way, and I don't know, and, and Black Panther was kind of new, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, this guy's been around for hundreds of years, and he's obviously, you know, people like him and stuff. So I, I don't know, I just, I'm going to hey. leave it there. Yeah. And the other thing I'll say to kind of wrap this up, Kevin, and this is again, maybe a little bit because of the comic knowledge, just a li- little bit here. Namor's kind of a dick in the comics. Mm-hmm. He's, 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 he's swinging he's, past your knees. He, he will, he will do the right thing as long as his country benefits from it. Okay. And right. his, his bottom line is no matter what, whether it's the right thing or the wrong thing, as long as his country is protected and his people are benefiting from it, that's all that matters. I so, do am looking forward to his character development in future stuff. So yeah, I, I do want to see him because we saw that we saw him come turn the circle at the end, which is good. Although I think his cousin, uh, 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 Nam- Namora. uh Namora Namora is like, mm, I'm going to be the next villain. <laughs> um, well, let, let me just put it this way. Her name. What? Like if, if he, I don't understand the her name because his name as name as Namor means you know child with no love, but mm-hmm. then to have her named Namora seems like there's a, that, that's, uh, a that's a whole other that's a whole other podcast. Me. Yeah, we well, we still got some more anyway, stuff to get to here. So yeah, <laughs> the only other it's like Angela. Angela, as... any any uh, female name with a a suffix uh, mm-hmm. is basically a feminized version of uh, a male name. Uh, you know that kind of thing yep. it just it's yeah. it's common enough yeah mm. yeah okay guys um let's move on because the next thing we got to talk about is another new character that was introduced and that is iron heart iron heart didn't have a huge role it was a, it was an important storyline moving piece and i liked the character but this was really for the point of wakanda forever and her appearance was really to set up her upcoming disney plus series which is, is i'm looking very forward to because it's gonna the, the disney plus series is actually going to deal with a um very interesting plot of machinery and technology versus mystical. And I, I think that's going to be very interesting to play out. But here we got our introduction to her. I love Dominique in the role. I think she brought an interesting en- energy, kind of a, um, a, a, a back to something to kind of a mirror for Suri to look into seeing herself at a young, younger age without having gone through all of this. I thought she, I brought, thought she was fun. I love this scene where they break into her garage. It's like, Oh my gosh, she's got Iron Man tech. And it's like the panic there, but, I really think they did a nice job with Ironheart as far as just her role in this movie. It wasn't too much. Maybe you could have even had a little bit more. Kevin, what were your feeling on Ironheart in this film? Uh, I I liked uh, I liked her introduction. I when we were discussing uh, the possibility of her uh, her introduction, Kyle, and that she's kind of like basically a, a female Iron Man. I guess mm-hmm. that was the way that it was, it was brought to my attention. And I love that idea. And I thought, and, and I liked how surprised they were when they were like, you figured this out, you did this. And, you know, and then you see her, her cool, like warehouse and the cool car and all that kind of stuff. Um, I, I, I just, I was kind of curious where, you know, her background would be. And maybe we'll get more of that in the Disney plus series. But, uh, you know, a character like her and her skills can't be, you know, kept under wraps for too long. And I I like the fact that she was getting this attention that wasn't good and that she was the scientist and she was the reason that she was the person that Namor wanted. But uh, I I thought that she that um, Dominic Thorne was just fantastic in this and the little moments that she had of, of, you know, being you know, in, in this new bigger world of superheroes and, you know, what her skill has brought to the table. It's going to be fascinating to see going forward. 
Yeah, I, I agree with you there. Um, Lacey, what were your thoughts on Ironheart in this film? Well, you know, I, okay. First of all, the actress is fantastic. I adore her. She's got some great, like, spunk. She's got some great fun lines. Um, but let's think about it this way. She was actually the only superhero in the movie for the first two hours. I mean, we didn't get Black Panther until an hour and 59 minutes in. Mm-hmm. So she was in, in, you know, essentially the superhero for a chunk of time before Shuri, you know, took on the mantle. Um, I love that she's got, she's got that swagger that kind of like, kind of like, you know, reminiscent of Tony. Um, but she also has the humor, you know, when she's like, oh, okay, so y'all ran out of Black Panthers when I got kidnapped. Like this is, this is exactly what they did to Leia and, and the Bird Chicken Indiana Jones. Like she's really funny. Um, I think, um, I think there's a lot more to, to, to look forward to. I love the fact that um, it felt like real genius with her little backstory that she was like, You beat me to it. That. Damn you. <laughs> I was like, like must have been Jerry Hathaway. That's so crazy because she was like, I did that for my metallurgy class. I didn't build anything for the CIA. And you know that like some of one of her professors was like, Hey guys, I got something to show you. Um, and I loved that. Um, I will say one other thing that I really loved, with the exception of the very first landing that Shuri has coming down, nobody in the entire movie does a superhero landing, and I love that. Namor didn't do any, uh, um, Iron uh, Ironheart didn't do any, and with the exception of the first entrance of Black Panther, nobody else did any uh, any superhero landings, which I thought was pretty cool. One of my favorite p- p- lines in this movie, I believe it was between Riri and uh, Shuri, was when the queen is talking to Shuri and she hangs up on her and she's like, you just hung up on the queen. She's like, no, I just hung up on my mother. <laughs> right? There's a difference. But Lee, what were your thoughts on Ironheart? Um, really good. I wish they'd used her better. Um, you know, she had a really good introduction. Um, and then, you know, we kind of have the, the cool thing. But one thing I did notice, um, her, and I've, Mentioned the correlation between uh, Black Panther and Iron Man 2. Her first set of armor looked like uh, the Whiplash armor from from Iron Man 2. Her second set of armor really looked like the What If armor that uh, Killmonger and Tony Stark built up. I was watching a lot of anime, like straight up, like (laughs) they've got that that anime style to it. Um, I think she did really good. I think... um, you would have to pry the keys from a 71 Cuda uh, 446 pack from my cold dead hands. I don't care if you're the uh, the captain of the guards of Wakanda. I- I'm gonna fight you for that. And if you dent that car, oh yeah, uh, Okoye would be oh bye bye at that point. Like that that car was too beautiful. Uh, but I do like how they incorporated the color scheme uh, with that. Uh, it was pretty cool. Um, and. Uh, that she had already figured out how to fly, that she established, oh, yeah, there's already a YouTube channel about me. So, like, we've got the setup not only for her, but for Armor Wars, um, which yeah. I still feel should be a series, not a movie, but that I don't get paid millions of dollars to make those choices. Well, yeah, the, the big thing is, is... Sorry, go ahead. Uh, the big thing is they are setting it up for the Iron Heart show. Ryan Coogler is so into this character. He is the executive producer on the Iron Heart show as well. So there is going to be a lot of connection there as well. So I think this character is going to be a very important piece in the MCU going forward. But I want to talk about another piece of the MCU that we got a, I was shocked. I was not expecting this character to show up. And I just want to address this real quick guys, because um, Val, uh, Julia Louise Dreyfus shows up in Black Panther and while it was a little bit surprising after the movie and I kind of had time to process everything it made sense she's going to be a huge part of phase five going forward she's going to be responsible for Thunderbolts Kevin she's kind of turning into the Amanda Waller of the MCU most definitely uh, she first appeared in a Falcon in the Winter Soldier TV series uh, as this mysterious uh, person uh, in the government uh, pulling some shenanigans, and then we see her in at the end of Black Widow as well. And uh, yeah, now this this is this is great. I, I'm curious to see how much power she's going to have in this, and the fact that that she, that she was once married uh, to um, uh, Ross, I think, is great. 
Yeah, in fact, I'm I'm really liking that because it means we're going to get more Everett Ross in the MCU, I believe, and I love Martin Freeman in that role. Um, Lee, what did you think of the surprise appearance of Val in this series? Uh, I wouldn't call it a surprise at this point. Um, I think that there is obviously something being set up. Uh, we, she is the the uh, the negative uh, Nick Fury at this point, and we know that Nick Fury has a different role from here on in. So. Uh, once she showed up in Winter Soldier and once she showed up uh, in uh, Black Widow, like she needs to be here. I, I was honestly kind of surprised we didn't see her in Thor. Uh, but uh, a good performance. Uh, she's really good at making people feel really uncomfortable. Uh, I like that. And uh, just the way that she played Ross was really cool. Lacey, what about you? What, uh, Val's been popping up all over the place in the MCU. I think she's going to be a big part going forward. Just one line. Maybe I'll come by and jump on your Peloton. <laughs> that was fantastic. Uh, you know, I, I love Julie Louis Dreyfus. She's uh, hilarious in everything she does, and she has this way, this sarcasm, this, this. She she has a a, a cadence in her in her speech that is unmatched. Like it's it's you can recognize it anywhere, and nobody else has it. She just has that something. Um, you know, like a Christopher Walken. Like you know, you know that someone's mimicking her when they're doing it um and you know as much as i i just can't stand the character it's the character that you you're supposed you know you're supposed to be wary of and i love that um and i think it's perfect for her yeah she's doing a phenomenal job with it uh, i'm looking forward to thunderbolts and seeing how she plays into that but guys it's time to head into phase four and wrap this thing up yeah lee real quick i just want to point out i just realized this is the third major uh film franchise where Martin Freeman lives in a nice cozy house outside of town <laughs> and somebody comes by and bothers him. And so he has to go on a journey like this is, uh, can we just, just <laughs> keep on? Cause I mean, he started, you know, really with uh, playing Arthur Dent and then he just basically Arthur dented himself into Bilbo and now he's billowing, uh, you know, uh, Ross. So, and you can almost say the same thing about his character in Sherlock. I mean, is, is, yeah, oh, that progressed yeah. too. As I say, the man has a very good agent. But let me burn off some tech test rack energy so we can close the show up with our final thoughts. Okay, guys. First of all, thank you so much for uh, joining me and Kevin for this episode of True Believers. This is a pretty important movie in the MCU, and of course, the end of Phase Four, and as we get ready to get into Phase Five and start really building towards um, the Kang Dynasty and Secret Wars conclusions of whatever this saga will be in Phase Six. But uh, guys, as we as we wrap up here, any final thoughts on Black Panther, Lacey? Um, I would just like to say that we can't go through the entire uh, podcast and not mention that um, that Michael B. Jordan's white sweater in the like dream world it is a rival to chris evans white sweater from knives out it's amazing i love it i wanted to see him in it all the time it was fantastic lee um really liked it i i think that they because it had to kind of stand on its own they missed a a few opportunities to tie in um a lot of things especially uh, there should have been a link to the Eternals. They're both dealing with the Spanish conquistadors during the age of exploration. Um, that would have been a way to link that in. Uh, they're dealing with gods. They're dealing with uh, mythology. That's when, you know, even if it had been in the past, um, it, I hope that that gets uh, brought in later. But obviously this movie has to stand on its own and not be, even though it is in that world, it has to be separate from anything else uh, just because of the weight of Chadwick's passing. Kevin phase four has been an interesting experience for the MCU. This film is wrapping it up. The epilogue to phase four is the guardians of the galaxy holiday special is black. Two questions for you is black Panther Wakanda forever, the best film of phase four. And what did you pull out of this film? Um, I don't know. I need to see it again. I, I was tired when I saw this just because of my schedule. And so I had a little fatigue. I'll be honest. I nodded off during the final battle scene a little bit, uh, with, uh, with Namor there, but, uh, I, I saw what happened at the end of that battle. So that was good. This is a long movie guys, three, two hours and 40 minutes with the credits and such. And then, you know, all of us diehards were watching through the end of the credits to see if there was going to be a final thing, but there wasn't. I checked Google. 
<laughs> yeah, I, I, I didn't do that. And uh, um, I, I would have napped probably because I was so tired. Uh, I don't know about the answer to that, Kyle. Um, I, I have seen others more, uh, and this 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 uh, face has had more misses. I'll say that. Uh, but um, uh, Shang Shang Chi is still one of my favorites of the movies. I'm just going to compare the movies right now. Uh, and this was good, and it was emotional. Um, but I like some fun in my movies as well. And Shang Chi gave me a little more fun. Um, and uh, was paced a little better as well. So, but I, I, I'm not gonna. That's just my initial thing. If you're gonna ask me right now, uh, that might change after uh, I'll rewatch or two of this one because I do want to rewatch it and, and look for some things. Yeah. For me, um, as I said at the top of the show, this was an emotional movie for me. I was hit pretty hard by the death of Chadwick Boseman, um, and it really for me, I think it was just as much as being a chance to finally close the chapter and and feel like I was saying goodbye to Chadwick Boseman along with, I think a lot of people in our audience in the, in the movie and the cast and the crew. And, you know, I want to thank Ryan Coogler and the amazing cast from top to bottom and all the people who contributed to this film for letting us share this film with them. They could have done this film, decided to say, no, we're going to grieve, deal with our grief privately and then make this movie. And they chose to put their grief into this movie and their emotions into this movie and let us share in it. And I think that was a very powerful choice and something that I think a lot of fans should be very thank thankful for. The, this movie to me is probably the most emotionally powerful film that has been done in the MCU. Am I going to say it's the best film? No, it's it has as a film, it has its holes. It has its moments that drag it. But this is a film emotionally and because of what had happened with it that it just got its own unique place in the MCU. And I think they did an absolutely phenomenal job under the circumstances they had to deal with. And we do know the black Panther will continue. Uh, there's a Wakanda series that's being developed for M's for Disney plus, which I would now like to see a young Prince T'Challa maybe make an appearance in that, in that show. I think they could have some fun there, but the MCU is now done with phase Oh, I should say that. They're almost done with Phase 4 because coming up next for the MCU on December 16th is the Guardians of the Galaxy holiday special, which Kevin Feige has said will be the epilogue to Phase 4 of the MCU. And then in February, we will kick things off with Phase 5 with Ant-Man and the Wasp, Quantumania. Um, Jonathan Majors is back as a different interpretation of Kang and one that I think is going to be much more lethal and much more deadly. And I'm very curious to see because this is really, I think, where we're going to kick off the major epic storyline for the future of the MCU. And it's going to be one that I think is going to take a lot of twists and turns, but again, thank you to our amazing podcast crew here. Kevin, as always, thank you so very much. It's a pleasure to have you Lacey, our resident Wakanda expert after seeing the film already three times. We, you, you always bring the Norse mythology and the thunder to the podcast, and I greatly appreciate it. You can find True Believers, of course. Are, if you're watching this on video, that means you found the Fandom Podcast Network YouTube channel. Uh, give us a like. Give us a subscribe. Give us a share. If you're listening to this as an audio version, you're listening to it probably either off of our master feed at fpnet.podbean.com, or you can find the Fandom Podcast Network on any of your major podcast catchers, including iTunes, iHeartRadio, and Spotify. Uh, visit our Facebook page, Fandom Podcast Network, where we keep you updated on all the events going on in fandom. And visit the True Believers page and join the group. We keep you updated on all the happenings within the MCU and whatever interesting things we find out there. You can email us directly at fandompodcastnetwork at gmail.com, on Instagram at fandompodcastnetwork, or on Twitter at fanpodnetwork. You can find me, Kyle, on Twitter at akylew, or on Instagram at akylefandom. Kevin, where can people find you on social media? You can find me, of course, on Facebook, and you can find me on Twitter and Instagram at Spartan underscore Phoenix. And please also uh, check me out. I'm there on the True Believers uh, Fandom Podcast Network Facebook group. Lee, where can people find you on social media? You can find me on uh, Twitter and Instagram at The Way of the Way. You can find me on Facebook under my name. Of course, over there doing uh, Blood of Kings uh, Facebook page with uh, – Kevin, uh, I've got a bunch of other stuff always going on. Um, you can see me in some upcoming films as well. Um, the Hand That Feeds uh, with Chris Mulkey of uh, X-Files fame and a uh, movie whose name escapes me, but uh, I actually got to make it with uh, Jeremy Davies and uh, blanking on his name, but Dr. Harrison Wells from uh, Tom, uh, Cavanaugh. Tom Cavanaugh. Yeah. Uh, so uh, Ed. Coming, yep. So those are coming out here pretty soon. 
And Lacey, of course, you joined us recently for the upcoming Time Warp that from 1982. That was that is going to be out later this week on the Phantom Podcast Network. Um, where can people find you on social media? Usually just here. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I'm, I'm on Facebook under my name, and I'm uh, I'm on Instagram under the Lacey Pants. Um, I'm taking a Twitter hiatus until all the craziness is fixed or worked out or something. Yeah. Well. For that, with that, guys, I want to thank so much to our listeners, to you guys. And as always, as we say around here at True Believers, Excelsior, make ours marvel, and for this podcast, Wakanda forever. Thank you for listening, and have a great time.